everybody. I'm here with James Poulter. I've known James for 10 years. Uh, he doesn't look old enough <laughs> yes. to have known me for 10 years. Sadly, <laughs> I look old enough to have known James for 10 years. So I met James 10 years ago. We did a session on uh, digital marketing. At some point, we should actually catch up on what has changed in those 10 years, but we keep meaning to. Oh, never gosh. Kind of, yeah. The stars don't quite align. Absolutely. But uh, James, thanks for doing this. Uh, you run Vixen Labs. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit about what Vixen Labs is, what you do, all of that kind of cool stuff that you're doing? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, no, uh, thanks for having us on to have a chat. And yeah, it's amazing how fast that time has flown. Um, and I suppose the the reason I do what I do now is because you know, we're entering into a new era of technology i think um and you know the thing that i've become really passionate about in the past few years is is the spoken word and voice technology and how we can now talk to our computers <laughs> and uh, we can talk to our technology and um as a as a result it's something that you know is becoming a huge part of everyday life for, for many of us you know you've got now nearly a quarter of homes in the uk that have a smart speaker like an amazon alexa or a google assistant device sorry for everybody that's listening that's now just set that off in their living room um you know and we've we've got to this point now where you know like you say 10 years you know something else that started 10 years ago siri came to the iphone it's not new. <laughs> Voice technology isn't isn't new. This has been around for a long time, and for those of us that have been using things like Dragon Dictation for years before that, you know, that's that's even been around for much longer. But um, we're really seeing this catalyst now with the smart speaker being, I suppose, kind of like the training wheels for people to get into using their voice more often with their technology because they're really cheap, they're easy to get into, you have to require almost no onboarding or teaching to use them and, and people are using them across all different ages and stages. And so when we spotted this a couple of years ago, at the time I was working as the head of emerging platforms at Lego, um, the toy company, looking at kind of new technologies and how we can integrate that into um, different things that we were doing around the business, um, mostly involved in selling small bits of plastic in boxes to children. And <laughs> we were thinking about, you know, what are the ways that we can engage people around um, their, their tech? And we designed some experiences in very early stages in conjunction with the team at Amazon for Alexa to be able to play and so that kids could be able to play with their Duplo bricks, which are the bigger bit bricks for kind of preschoolers and top toddlers and they would be able to listen and play stories at the same time of talking to Alexa and I got really intrigued by this technology and so in um, the October of 2018 I chose to leave the business and go out and and start something of my own which is something I'd always wanted to do after having spent 10 you know plus years working in corporate agencies and then in-house and so we founded Vixen Labs, which is uh, we now say is Europe's leading voice consultancy and design studio. And we work with a wide array of Fortune 500 and FTSE 500 companies to help them essentially give their voice uh, to their brand and, and allow brands to have uh, a voice and, uh, and start conversations with users because we think it's the most natural, most organic way of engaging with technology that we've ever had. And, uh, you know, obviously, I'm sure we'll come on to talk about it, but in a world of post-COVID you know, touch-free devices and all of these kind of things that we're now looking for, suddenly it has an even higher resonance factor. So, yeah, that's what we've been working on for the past couple of years, building a team around that. So just to be difficult, <laughs> um, one man and his dog has been saying, you must start a podcast, you must start a podcast. Where do you see that? Not for the big brands who can kind of afford to yeah. do all of this stuff and not make any money from it in the short term. Where do you see that kind of voice thing, podcasts in this whole voice um, category? So what we've seen in the time that it's taken for platforms like Alexa and Google Assistant to kind of come to regular usage. So like I say, what latest statistics we have in the US, it's around about a third of homes. In the UK, it's about a quarter of homes have one of these devices. In that same time period over the past 18 to 24 months, we've seen a doubling and then a redoubling in the consumption of long form audio, particularly podcasts, but also it's affected audio books and it's affected um, you know, interactive story functions like these Alexa skills and Google Assistant actions that we can build now. And so podcasting amongst that mix has grown substantially because we're all looking for essentially things to do when we don't have to be looking at a screen Screen, where we've got hands maybe occupied, eyes maybe occupied. That might be when you're driving and commuting. Well, none of us are doing very much of that in the minute, but when, when you are able to do that again, um, you know, commuting, whether that's doing the washing up and it would try, you know, whatever it might be. And we're trying to find alternative methods that don't involve us being essentially eyes down, hands occupied into a screen to consume content. 
And so podcasting has become a, yeah, a real resurgence. And, and then layer on top of that, voice technology, giving ability, I suppose, to find and discover that content in a far more easy way than it has been before. Podcasting since the dawn of time has had discoverability issues. You know, large catalogs syndicated by RSS feeds into you know, kind of walled gardens of things like the podcast store for iOS and you know, Google Podcasts or later players like Acast and Spotify and many others. You know, these things have always made it slightly difficult to navigate that as a, as a, uh, a paradigm and now voice technology kind of comes in and gets rid of all of those different wall gardens and layers and just you know tell me what you want and you say what you want to it and then you find it so um now that that, that experience the ecosystem isn't perfect by any stretch right now there's a long way to go in fixing it but it is moving in that direction that you know we are always looking for content to fill those little moments in the day um which we would otherwise not be able to do so where it's not always convenient to, to pull out something that's more visually driven and so i think that's where particularly podcasting and you know audio in all different formats um is really kind of seeing a kind of renaissance i suppose at the moment that you know we saw in the early days of you know kind of radio and podcasting you know, kind of in the early 2000s that's now kind of come back around it's taken about 20 years to mature out <laughs> but it's now gotten to that point where actually you know brands and individuals and you know creators influencers and everybody in between are seeing that actually the audio medium has something really special about it that is hard to replicate um you know in social media and text driven or visual driven uh, mediums because it just doesn't have that same warmth and empathy and that individual personal connection and it also doesn't you know have the production uh, barriers of video now obviously mm -hmm. those production barriers are coming down all the time right i'm talking to you on you know a, a camera with the technology now that would have you know even five years ago probably cost five times the amount that it takes to do it now but um you know the production values on audio for for someone with an iphone in their pocket really can you know produce actually quite high quality content i think that that barrier drop has also helped a lot of people get started so so when we're talking about audio how how can, you know, I said before we started this, there'll be such a range of people watching this from a small business freelancer all the way through to bigger companies. What are some of the easy things that they can do to uh, take advantage of the, the rise of voice? Absolutely. Well, so if you want to start with the kind of the smaller companies, I think yeah, anyone that's starting a brand or a business today needs to be considering that voice isn't just something that they might want to consider. It's kind of something they will have to consider. And the reason being is that the biggest search engine in the world, which is Google, is intimately interweaving Google Assistant in to its core product suite. Um, you know, it's hard now to separate what is Google Assistant and what is Android, or what is Google Assistant and what is the Google search bar that you plug things into, because the underlying technologies are so interwoven. And that means that you know, if you're starting a business and you want to make sure that people, when they ask their device, you know, your location times, your opening times, or you know, directions and stuff like that, that is all reliant upon knowing how to make sure the metadata behind your website, the metadata of your content on YouTube or wherever else it is, is optimized to make sure that you're not just answering keywords, those one or two words like McDonald's opening times, because no one says McDonald's opening times, their Google Assistant. They say, hey, what time is the nearest McDonald's open? That's a far more complex question to ask. And you need to make sure that all of your content is optimized to make sure you're answering those questions, those longer form discussions, which um, which people are having. So the first thing that for people who are starting out in that very early state is to just get an understanding you know, like your web content, if you're starting out, you know, how are you how are you using that? And then progressing on to things like audio. So podcasting and things like flash briefings, which are these short form news updates that you can uh, create very easily for things like Alexa, um, you know, which they have. A number of templates that you can use now uh, called blueprints so you can just hop onto the, the amazon developer platform and and create a blueprint for it for your skill or for your flash briefing makes it very easy to just upload short form bits of audio content which if you have a brand or a business that has daily updates or new things happening every week you know if you're some uh, you know maybe you've got a i don't know a week a weekly recipe at your local cafe that changes or a special that's on every weekend that people need to know about those types of updates can now be delivered in audio in a quick way as part of people's daily routine and that's the biggest thing that we we see that's important to understand about voice is it is a routine and habitual uh, driven medium you know you wake up in the morning you say to alexa hey good morning alexa yeah get me the news and then you're going to get a rundown of all those different things you subscribe to not picking and choosing 
you hear them in real time and in order. And so most people are, you know, are willing to kind of t you know, listen to your brand for a few minutes of piece of content that isn't interrupting their day, that's adding something to that habit and that routine. And that's what is a real opportunity. So do you think because we've had such a visual world for so, you know, we've this, you know, our media started as audio, then became visual, and we've had uh, probably 60 odd years of visual domination. And now we're starting yeah. to see voice come in. Do you think there's kind of like a switch that needs to trip in people's heads about this? Because when you talk about search, and I know from my own point of view, I've not done the podcast yet. I want to do it, but I, ju I just think, Wah! you know what I mean? What do I need to do? Yeah. You have to really rethink about how people are, just like you were saying, how people search, because we're so used to, you have to be on the top of Google. You have to be in the first number of listings, all of that kind of stuff. This is turning that on its head to some degree. Well, the big difference in voice is that you don't want 10 blue links being read out to you to give you the option of what to answer. And, th and that's why the platforms don't do it. If you ask Alexa a question, it makes its best guest answer and gives you the answer. And that's the answer you get. The same thing. So that's whether that's an Amazon listing of a product result, whether that is a you know, direction to a location, maybe it's a recipe. Unless you're use, unless you're about of one in five users that have a screen-based device. So one of the um, one of these smart displays. I don't know if people can see this. Uh, so one of these like Google. I'm holding up for those listening a kind of Google smart display. <laughs> um, you know, one of these kind of Nest hubs that has a screen that's going to give you that kind of visual feedback. For most people, they're listing on a uh, you know thirty five dollar Amazon Echo Dot or a Google Home Nest Mini, and those devices they just read you the first answer. So actually, basic SEO and being you know top of the search result for that question that really matters to your business is one of the most fundamentally important things to kind of get right because as more and more people move to asking their devices and not just smart speakers, which is really important to say, but any device where their voice can be enabled, which is literally every device now, every phone, every, you know, uh, you've got half a billion active users of Google Assistant on mobile devices right now. So, you know, everyone that's talking to those devices, it matters what the answer is to those questions that matter to your brand. And that's where you have to kind of start out in, in that journey. Everything on top of that, building experiences, or more actively marketing those opportunities, you know, if you're a petrol garage and you have got a special offer on, you know, putting a banner up one mile up the road from people saying, "Hey, ask Google Assistant what the what the petrol price is in your car," you know, suddenly outdoor advertising has a whole another you know medium, right? You know, you can start really pushing people through to interact with things on the go when they're in places where you never would have been able to get their attention before. It's, you know, it's pretty dangerous to get people to do things in their car. <laughs> other than speaking to something. Um, so yeah, all of these things become possible um, when you begin to engage with uh, that slightly different way of thinking about it, as you said. It's about thinking about the, the way in which we speak, not just the, the words or the intents that we're trying to get to, but the way in which those intents are articulated. Because if you can get your head around the questions people are asking about your brand, that's where you're going to be able to really win when it comes to voice. Okay. We'll come back to this in a minute, but how's COVID been for you? Hmm. Well, I suppose like with anybody, there's many different ways of answering that question. Um, th I think I had it. Um, I'm not entirely sure because it was before they had rolled out the active testing or any of the antibody testing. So I'm waiting to get an antibody test. Uh, but I had one of the worst flu-like symptoms I've ever had actually in early February. Um, which does kind of make me think that there was a possibility that this was around for a lot longer, but all of the hallmark symptoms with the exception of the loss of taste. And so I'm pretty sure I had it um, back in the very early stages. And and I was in New York um, in the week that Trump shut the borders. So I was on the second to last flight out of JFK before they stopped letting anyone new back into the country. And I can say that that was one of the weirdest experiences that I think I've ever endured in travel. And I've had some weird travel stories over the years. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, it's been a really interesting experience for us as a business. We've been fortunate. We had a semi-remote team anyway. As a team of six of us based in an office in central London, which was a very nice office that we moved into in January, and I spent four weeks there, and now I've not spent any time since <laughs> since then. So we hope to be able to get back there for some format in the future. Uh, but many of our team are um, around the world and in different places and work remotely. So uh, for us, it's it's not been too big a shift. 
I think the big thing that we've seen there is that many clients and businesses have began to reach out and we've had a number of inquiries around, you know, what should we be thinking about after this crisis, you know, kind of lifts and as we begin to live with this this disease and, and this virus kind of in our, our midst. And a big thing, you know, you've seen that just this past recording of people, the law on Monday changed um, this week in the UK for, you know, mandatory wearing of face masks on public transport that's one part of the puzzle, but you've still got people touching ticket machines. You've still got people having to go up to you know, people on the train. You've still got people try- having to push buttons to open doors and close toilets and you know, press flush buttons in toilets and all of those kind of things. And so you know, the, the big opportunity I think that lies ahead for us and one of the biggest things we're learning out of what's come from COVID is that you know, voice technology may become one of you know, it's not that it's not a savior to everything by any stretch, but it may be one of the answers in our arsenal in terms of making certainly the outdoor built environment and places where you know, you've got heavy traffic of people potentially a little bit safer by not having long touch screens and things like that. And that's not to say the screen going away, in fact, we're going to need them more than ever in terms of visual interfaces. Um, but in terms of the way in which we control those, that may change. Mm-hmm. So, um, so we're seeing opportunity, and then on the personal level, we've been you know, here for, thir- well, I've been here for longer than most people because I, c- I came straight back in into kind of quarantine from uh, New York. So I've been at home for about 14 weeks with two small children <laughs> um, and running a business from home. Um, I've invested the money we've been saving at the office to upgrade my home tech setup so I can actually get work done. And um, in many respects, I think we've been more productive than ever before um, in lots of ways. And at the same time, you know, that, team community and togetherness there's you know I, I believe that we are embodied beings for a reason and you know we're there to be around other embodied beings and it's hard to you know hard to um, do everything uh, without being with one another and so we definitely welcome the times when we can get back together but for now no we, we've coped with it okay i would say <laughs> and certainly not as bad as, as many others who've been obviously so negatively impacted it's interesting you say that because um, a friend of mine directed me to a piece of research from McKinsey, um, big consulting firm, um, and they've said that one of the impacts of COVID is it's accelerated the uptake of the digital world by five Absolutely. years. Because suddenly... Even yeah, I those, would say possibly even 10. <laughs> yeah, suddenly those people who... Uh, without being ageist, but have been around a bit longer who have resisted the likes of Facebook and LinkedIn and video conferencing even are now going, we have to do it to do our jobs. Yeah, completely. I think that it's, I think that acceleration is even more so than five years. I mean, I'll take my father's business, for example, for 20 plus years now, he's run a recruitment and HR firm that works exclusively in the law practice in the, in the chambers of, um, the ends of court here in central London. And the courts have been, radically disrupted by this situation you've moved to online litigation you've moved to online arbitration and mediation services you know kind of potentially reduced juries online juries in some countries you know that whole system has been fundamentally disrupted and it was a thing that they were on a change they weren't, they weren't on a the first of 10 years of being like well in 10 years time we'll get there they just were never going to go there <laughs> it was it was just an even factor into the journey and here they are you know i've been helping him get set up on like running zoom webinars and things like that over the past couple of weeks they've moved to online litigation and for the first time i've got him to stop carrying around a massive bag of papers to and from central <laughs> london to go to his office and realize he didn't have to print all of his emails and so you know digital transformation you know has always it's never been about the technology in my mind it's always been about people it's always been about culture and habits and behaviors and you know if you if you read some of the science around kind of habit formation you need a substantial trigger to create a new habit and it has to be reinforced over time and the problem with most you know these kind of change journeys that people go on whether it's trying to introduce slack or microsoft teams or whatever it might be to their organization or getting people on zoom and things like that you know they they have really good intent the trigger is there's someone in your organization that wants it to be different. Often, you know, someone, you know, lower down who doesn't have the power to institute it at the highest levels mm-hmm. in they come, but there is no habit loop formed because there's no repetition. There's no reason to reinforce it. And what COVID has done is taken away everybody's ability to get out of that habit loop. There has been no other option. The trigger was big enough <laughs> to come down and you couldn't get out of the loop. 
it was like someone you know chaining you into a kind of a gym membership where basically like you would be actively flogged if you didn't turn up to it yeah it's kind of like yeah so that's what's happened with a lot of the technology adoption that we've seen over the past 12 weeks is that people can't get out of it they have th there is no other way and then once that habit has been formed it's actually so hard to undo um and so if you know if people are watching haven't um you know kind of read uh, charles duhigg's book that you know the power of habit one of the you know most foundational books in this space or atomic habits by james clear both of those i highly recommend as kind of good starting places because that is what we're seeing um is that you know it took something like this to force that down and the thing that's really i think fascinating now is it's not that there are just people that um you know have accelerated their change journeys there are people that are just were never going to go on that journey at all that have suddenly realized oh we can do things differently um and you know uh, you know god let's hope that there is a virus but uh you know not a virus you know um anymore and that we've got some kind of cure and vaccine coming down the line but i think by all reasonable estimations it's going to take some time for that to happen and i think that it's going to go on long enough that we will not see a retrenchment back to how things were completely a blend possibly but the idea that we kind of go back to what we had before i think is is long gone by this point yeah it's almost it, it has killed the habit and created new ones that actually exactly. it's, going to, it's going to be weird going back i mean i had the most awkward encounter here in the office the other day somebody came in to say hello and you had this kind of awkwardness because hello <laughs> you know the social distancing thing it's actually quite strange to the po point where you go what's the point yeah. of actually meeting in person yeah exactly and i think that's the thing is until we can get over that hump of the the social distancing thing you know until until you can go back to those human the thing that you know you can't undo is however long we've all been alive is worth of human interaction and person-to-person -person interaction yeah. we're still having it obviously in limited cases within our family groups and you know social bubbles and things like that um so it's natural that because those habits have continued in our personal lives you always will want those to extend into the professional you'll always want those to extend into the places where we are out and about with people and because that artificialness of that oh i've got to keep my distance from you still exists exists i think many people will call into question yeah you know, we're asking the question of our own business you know we've got a, a lovely studio in south london but why would i go back there if only i can go there if three of my team can't get there because they, they've got to get on public transport for too long for it to feel comfortable as a risk well, there's no point in me going back there to be there on my own <laughs> it doesn't make any sense yeah. so you know then it calls into question the whole thing and you know i would rather take that money that we're paying for some very lovely swanky desks and and plow that back into being able to travel and see my team in the future or you know when we're allowed to meet up have better and more quality um opportunities to you know kind of be together and i think the biggest thing is it's called into question why are we you know forcing everybody onto peak hour trains to show up to do the email for the first hour of the day on their own at a desk that they could have done at home well, like what's the point so um yeah i think it's fundamentally going to change a lot of our our working habits and behaviors so um lots of scary uh, and we'll wrap up with this one and tell people where they can find you and all that kind of stuff sure but the million dollar question james and i've got every confidence you're going to get this right <laughs> What's going to happen to our economy in the next six to 12 months? What do you see? You know, uh, there's debate. Is it a V? Is it a, a U? Is it an L? How do you see the recovery happening? Bad, good, ugly, whatever. Um, I think it's going to be a WWW economy. <laughs> and I mean that in two different ways. One is that our, our understanding of how this thing is going to go is going to be up and down, up and down, up and down for quite a sustained period of time. Um, what you're going to see happen, I think, is that obviously right now, the big sectors that are being most heavily hit, hospitality, you know, leisure and entertainment, uh, you know, the furlough scheme beginning to kind of close down. And then people are looking at those 30, 60, 90 day, um, you know, uh, time periods that they had for people's, um, you know, what do you call it, break, break clauses and things like that in their contracts and notice periods, you're going to begin to see those kind of come in. And a lot of people that are having to make those really tough decisions right now probably will be having to let a lot of people go. But then how many businesses may be regenerated by those people that come out of those other companies 
and then create new models of doing things because they're the ones that have had the time off while they've been furloughed to have those creative ideas to think about how they might kind of get around it. You know, if I was a, if I had any real money in the investing game right now, I'd be investing in people that sell supplies for food trucks. I'd be investing in people who've got supplies for um, you know makers of perspex. I'd be yeah, literally any, any of these things because they're all going to be the things that are going to come in as you know many more people. We're always seeing, for example, in in China a resurgence in the the companies that make all the supplies for. China China's outdoor markets, for example, having a real rise because people are having to, they go, we can't do business indoors anymore. Right, let's bring it outside. Let's pop up markets. Let's do tents. Let's do camping and glamping. So all of these industries are going to have a, a slight second resurgence. The big unknown is, is when that WWW is going to become more shallow and even itself out to just a small ripple as opposed to that up and down variance. So I think we'll only know the answer to that um, when we kind of get clearer on whether or not a second wave is, is going to come. So I think the economy is going to do that, but the other WWW economy is going to be the shift to online. Mm -hmm. And I think as what we've seen you know, with you know, technologies like Zoom, like Microsoft Teams, like Google Hangouts, what that is going to do is we're going to see actually a large part of the service sector that was occupying the offices of central London is going to move fundamentally into a blended mode. Lots of that is going to go online for part of their day. Not entirely, you know, not 100%, but they're going to go into this blended mode. And what that's going to do is probably dismantle some of the structures around the city, dismantle some of the urbanization you know, trends that we've seen where people will go, well, actually, I'm, I'm even considering myself, right? I'm sat, in an I'm sat in my home office. I can see my work office is up the up the horizon uh, on the river and uh, the only reason i live here is because i chose to live here so i didn't have to travel too far to get to there but if i don't have to go there then i don't have to be here <laughs> and so that's going to you know kind of raise some real questions about you know people wanting to live that kind of more nomadic lifestyle wanting to be able to not have to be on a commuter train line you know and that's going to move a lot of our economy into kind of more virtual spaces so i think that that www thing is going to happen in in that kind of twofold both in terms of the economic recovery but also in terms of what it's going to do for digital businesses because so many of us have realized that they can do these things completely virtually now and does this this almost helps the freelancer because suddenly everybody yeah. is like a freelancer. It does. I think, um, you know, the, um, I think the one thing that COVID hasn't dismantled is the dynamics of supply and demand. And I think that the problem that we have right now is that you're going to find, yes, many more people are going to go out and, um, you know, they are going to find themselves potentially trying to do that freelance work. I think freelance is an interesting mode. I think what you probably are going to see is clusters of smaller groups of people, more small businesses being generated and more teams being founded. The one thing, as I say, is that this is not an economy to try and do things on your own. Um, I don't think that, you know, that that security is definitely not there, but the the ability for people to perhaps work in looser structures than what we've had before. I'm not saying that there's going to be a whole burgeoning weight of loads of companies being formed, but people working in more collegiate ways, facilitated by digital tools. You know, look at the economy that's booming, you know, these, these sub disappearing economies on things like Fiverr, you know, um, you know. Um, task rabbit you know, obviously now owned by ikea yeah you know, these kind of like secondary business you know economies that are, are bubbling up and i think on places like linkedin uh you know people are going to start paying more attention to you know how they can create content how they can move their service businesses into digital businesses uh, and if they're a product business you know how they can go direct to consumer and circumvent the big chains and i think that you know that's where uh, you know every crisis from you know whether that's the financial crash of 08 whether it's the you know the gold rush, you know, whichever, they've always been times of you know mass disruption. And what comes after mass disruption is people coming up with new ideas and coming back together into smaller collegiate forms and then aggregation over time until the next big disruption. So I think over the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to see a lot of those people in the those dips of that WWW be the ones that, yes, they may fall out, but that's the ones that are going to rise above it over time. Because I, I think I just have a big belief that people are, um, you know, not going to fundamentally stay in a funk forever, that they're going to you know, see the benefits of what this new economy might provide for them and, and generate new ideas off the back of it. So massive decentralization of London, do you reckon? I, I mean, yeah, St. Paul's Cathedral is still going to be where St. Paul's Cathedral is. The Tate Modern is not moving, right? So there are certain things that um, you know, remain fixtures. I'm not saying that we're going to see the dismantling of the city, but what I think you are going to see is that, particularly for large enterprises and corporations, the questions of why have this massive OPEX burden of running a huge site will make less sense. So I think you're going to see 
higher yield from you know the, the sites that they have you know lower density potentially different working patterns and people wanting to move to a more blended workforce and i think that that has potential you know, it's it's no surprise to me in some ways that we're seeing you know this whole debate around things like the black lives matter movement happening at the same time as these massive disruptions caused as a, as a wake of a health crisis and then an economic crisis on top of that what that might allow us to do is actually give new opportunities for different people from different backgrounds you know whether that's working mums whether that is people you know who are wanting to have blended parenting at home whether that's people who are coming from more diverse backgrounds that haven't had opportunities before you know when everybody is just a, a, another window on a zoom call at the other end it makes it a lot less um you know it's, it makes it a lot easier to kind of open up those conversations potentially and also give people the flexibility because the big thing this has broken down is that you know what lots of people have said about flexible working is that oh you know i can't trust my team to be at home and you know not be you know doing walking the dog in the middle of the day or doing online shopping hey guys they were doing that at their desks anyway <laughs> when they were in your <laughs> office um you know they were they were spending 20 minutes chatting to someone in the coffee queue they were you know nipping out to go to the pharmacy and also do a little bit of shopping in the high street like they were doing these things anyway so you know them doing them at home is actually no less productive because they're you know then less tired from getting on a train being packed under somebody else's arm on the jubilee line for half an hour every morning <laughs> i'd certainly feel better for not doing that yeah cool james as ever you're a superstar so thank you for coming on <laughs> thanks, thanks for Where, having the time where's the best places to connect with you uh is, i suppose on a personal level you can find me on linkedin uh always welcome a connection if you send and the request <laughs> i'll accept it and we can chat um so you can find me there um and you can also find uh vixen labs at vixenlabs.co uh, so .co uh, which is the place to go and find we're just launching our new website next week so go check that out whenever you're watching this and you can find out more about what we do over there um and you can find out me on all of the other social media just at james Poulter, pretty much wherever else uh, you might want to connect and you're happy for people to pick your brains uh in whatever channel they come and find you. You'll, you'll, if you find me in different places, you'll find slightly different things, but I'm always willing to have a chat. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Awesome. James, let's not make it 10 years again. <laughs> absolutely cause, not. Because you'll look exactly the same and I'll be like... <laughs> I, I wish that were the case. <laughs> I'll, I'll need a Zimmer frame. <laughs>